Um, okay, in a moment we'll see. Um, yes, the recording has started, so please, Francisco, go ahead. Oh, um, okay. Can, can you see my? Uh, can you see this, the the window? My yes, you can, yeah. you can. You can yeah. see. It. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been very fun being here, even though virtually. I was. Uh, yeah, actually, I've always been interested in learning something about subramanian geometry and hyperlytic operators. So it's been uh, very helpful for me uh, being here. Um, yeah, and um, so, uh, so I'll talk about. Uh, um, yeah, I'll talk about nonlinear uh, elliptic problems in topology. And you know, I hope that uh, you, you'll learn something from what I say uh, in case you're interested in the topic. Um, yeah. Um, um, yeah, and hopefully this will lead to some interesting questions also uh, at the end or during the rest of this workshop. Um, yeah, so um, well, what I want to tell you about is like how, uh, yeah, as the title say, we're, we're thinking about nonlinear uh, elliptic problems. And the goal of uh, the, this lecture is to show you how one can study problems in symplectic and contact topology uh, by looking at the space of solution of certain nonlinear elliptic uh, differential equations. Okay, so in particular, there are two uh, specific kind of equations that one usually uses to um, do this. So the first equations are like the uh, pseudo holomorphic curves. curves. And then the other ones are, uh, and this works in every dimension, and the other one are the cyber witten equations. Uh, and this only works if you're interested in dimension uh, three plus one. So you said three dimensional contact manifolds and uh, cobordings, uh, like symplectic stuff in dimension four. Yeah, and you know, really they are the same, uh, um, the, the same, um, the, the two faces of the same coin. So it really they, they are, they interact, they're, they interact, interact in a very rich way. Um, and in particular, uh, for example, uh, Taub's proof uh, of the Weinstein conjecture uh, um, it uses very in a very deep way this interaction between these two aspects, uh, these two kind of equations. Uh, so yeah, so the markers provide a very nice a connection with rev orbit, but then to, to show non vanishing of certain invariants when using the cyber witten theory of the story. So the interaction between these two is very important. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, today's lecture will be most of an outline, or I, I can, I'll try to explain the ideas behind what's going on. And so for that, um, you know, uh, we decided, uh, I talked to with the organizer, we decided to focus more on the pseudo holomorphic curves. Uh, aspect of the theory uh, because the equations are somehow easier to write down. But then I'll, at the end, I'll tell you what happens in the cyber Witten world too a little bit. Um, yeah, so uh, just to, to move on, like uh, I guess uh, um, uh, Patrick uh, wrote down a, a list of uh, problems that are interested, questions that are interested in, uh, in um, contact and symplectic topology. And in particular, you know, today we'll focus on two problems that uh, one can try to solve with that. So just to uh, remind you what these problems are. So first of all, you know, if I give you two contact structures on a given uh, three manifold, it's very natural to ask whether you can show uh, are they isotopic or not as contact structures. Okay, and this is particularly interesting if it's uh, if they are uh, actually isotopic as plane fields. Uh, so there's something really subtle uh, about the contact structure. So in particular, you know. Um, for example, at the moment we don't know, like for, for what uh, Patrick said, you know, it, it's not clear that the type contact structure on S3 and the over two state contact structure in the same same field are not isotopic. For example, that's that's a hard uh, theorem. And then the other question is like, uh, is um, if we give you a contact to manifold, is it fillable? So if you remember, fillable means that you know we have white psi, and the question is like, is there a compact symplectic manifold? And omega, which has y psi as its uh, boundary, okay, with certain uh, compatibility condition at the bound at the boundary. So, for example, today we'll focus on what uh, um, Patrick called strongly 
uh, fillable. Okay. Um, okay, so these are the kind of questions I will focus on uh, today. Uh, yeah, so uh, as I was saying, I'll try to give an idea of what's going on. And I think uh, a lot of the princip basic principles of what's going on. Uh, so, so we think about nonlinear elliptic PDEs, but you know the basic principles already are, are very. Um, you know, I think it's it's good to focus on a finite dimensional case first to see what kind of ideas uh, one can invent um, to one can use to uh, try to define topological invariants out of equations. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a basic idea from the differential topology in finite dimensions, um, and you know uh, I think. Uh, a good reference for this is Milner's little book. Uh, so this is the topology from the differential boogie point. It's a very short book, but I think it contains a, a lot of very cool uh, math. Uh, so, uh, so this is a, a, a nice reference for what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, yeah, so let's say we have a, a smooth map from... Uh, uh, so this is a closed manifold. Uh, to ascend. So this is a smooth map. Okay, so um, yeah, so we want to, you know, we, there are, in principle, there are many homotopy classes of these kind of maps. Uh, yeah, so we want to try to find some kind of invariance of these homotopy classes. So one way to do it using differential topology is the following. Uh, so for generic P, in uh, ascend, so you know, you look at, po at point, and for a generic point, uh, the pre-image turns out to be a finite number of points. Uh, and there, there, are, there are points with signs. Okay, so you know that's because MN and SN are both have the same dimension. So uh, generically, the the fiber would be zero dimensional, um, and this follows from Sartre's theorem, essentially. Sartre's theorem plus inverse function theorem. Okay, so we can define the uh, definition. Uh, so the degree of the of, of this map. Let's define the degree of this map uh, to be uh, the cardinality of this uh, fiber um, um, p, which is an integer. So each point comes with a sign, uh, like become, depending if the, the point changes or preserves the orientation of the point uh, for a generic p. Okay, so we're essentially counting the number of solutions to a very simple equation, f of x equals p. Um, okay, so now the theorem is the following. So, uh, so the basic result is, um, uh, so the degree of f is well defined. Okay, so here, you know, the, if you look at the definition, uh, it, it depends on the generic point it choose, right, in principle. So this is independent of P. And the other basic result is that if F is homotopic to G, like a smooth maps, uh, then the degree F is the same as the degree of G. Okay, so the number of solutions to this equation uh, gives you an invariant of homotopy. So it gives you a topological invariant. Um, yeah, so let me just give you an idea how to prove the first point. Uh, so let me, maybe let me recall this A and B. A and B. Um, uh, yeah, so let me just give you a sketch of the proof of A. Um, yeah, so let's say, you know, uh, we have our SN, so our MN, and we have our map F, and we have two points, P and P prime. And we want to show that the pre, uh, two generic points, and we want to show that the pre-image of P and the pre-image of F, uh, of P prime, have the same number of points. So the basic idea uh, here is to take a generic path between them, gamma, this is a generic path. 
Okay, and then uh, the, the, what, what, what happens, so this is ascent, is that, you know, F inverse of gamma, again, this is an application of uh, Sartre theorem and the inverse function theorem. This will be a smooth, compact, uh, oriented uh, one manifold uh, with boundary given by F inverse of uh, P, P prime, this joint union F inverse of P with the opposite orientation. Okay, so the picture to have in mind is the following. So, you know, this is our P, our gamma and P prime. And then uh, this is our uh, F and the pre-image will be something like this, let's say. You know, it's a one manifold. Okay, and it has boundary exactly, you know, this will be, this is F inverse of P, and this is F inverse of P prime. Okay, and you can see now that, uh, you know, counted with signs, uh, they have, you ha have the same number of points. And that's because uh, an oriented, a compact uh, one manifold has, you know, zero boundary points. Okay, so you have uh, a compact oriented one manifold, the number of boundary points uh, is zero if you count that with sign. Okay, so th this tells me th this. Um, um, so I guess uh, a, a one, one compact one manifold has zero boundary points. Once we count them with sign. Okay, so this is really the basic principle. The fact that a compound one manifold has zero boundary points once you count them with sign is the, the basic principle behind anything that I will tell you about. Okay, so this is really, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the underlying principle of all the relation between topology and uh, elliptic PD in some sense. Okay, so uh, so as a, as a as a, you know, the, what's the punchline is that uh, we can obtain topological invariants by looking at, uh, in finite dimensions at least, by looking at spaces of solutions uh, to equations. So here the equation is like uh, x such that f of x equals p. Okay, and this, uh, as I say, you know, we, we work in a very simple setup. The, you know, we look at map from SN, uh, this recovers uh, th this notion of degree that, you know, uh, you, you know, one, one can define also from looking at homology, for example. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess the, the point now is that, uh, so uh, th this also works. Uh, uh, in uh, certain specific uh, infinite uh, dimensional settings. Okay, so, uh, but of course, uh, it's hard to make sense of this in, in, ge in general um, setting, uh, uh, but you know, all this, in we'll see that a very important thing is that, you know, this is, uh, the setting always involves uh, certain elliptic equations. Okay, and the, the key point is that, you know, elliptic operators are frail. Uh, if, if you if you're on a compact manifold at least, and so this implies that you know Freedom operator one should think of them as operators which are almost uh, finite dimensional, essentially or essentially finite dimensional. Okay, so because uh, we work with elliptic equations, somehow we we are really working in some kind of finite finite dimensional setting, um, and that's the point of using the elliptic equation rather than other kind of equations. Um, okay, um, any questions so far? No, I think, I think it's very clear. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, so, 
Um, yeah, so with, with this in mind, let, let's look at some actual example that uh, would be useful. So, um, yeah, I, unfortunately, when you try to look at contact stuff, it's really, you, you look at equations of stuff with boundaries, so it's a little more complicated. So I'll start with the closed case before for simplicity. Yeah, so uh, this is the setup of J-holomorphic curves. Um, so we look at um, a, 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 a symplectic manifold. So this, we'll think of it as closed, let's say. And this is a symplectic form. And uh, yeah, so as um, Patrick uh, told us about uh, in his class, uh, in his lectures, uh, there is an, you know, there's a really nice interplay in, in, a, in the same way killer, in killer geometry, uh, that happens in killer geometry between almost complex structures and uh, symplectic uh, structures. So in particular, uh, it, it's very natural to look at the space of all complex structures on, on the um, on the on your tangent bundle. So these are just endomorphisms that squares square to the identity. Uh, but then uh, we, we we want some kind of compatibility with your uh, syntactic form. Uh, so in particular, uh, we we are interested in uh, almost complex structure for which this tensor omega uh, and you plug in j in the second one before plugging in the vector. Uh, we want this to be a Riemannian metric. Okay, so this is what happens. You know, if J is integrable, this is exactly the definition. You know, the, the J omega will give you a Kähler manifold. But here, our J need not, needs not to be integrable. Okay, and the basic fact uh, that it's very important here um, is that um, uh, if uh, the space of J uh, such that J is compatible. J almost complex structures compatible with uh, omega. Uh, this is uh, non empty and uh, contractible. Okay, so really all we need for our purposes is that it's connected. So if I pick, so if I get two choices of almost complex structure, you can somehow interpolate between them through uh, almost complex structure, uh, which are um, which are compatible. Uh, but yeah, so this is uh, um, this is a fact in algebraic topology essentially. Um, yeah, so but you know in particular it's not empty to begin with, so we can fix one. Uh, so. So we uh, fix it, fix a, let's fix a J and then we look at maps from S2 to, to our uh, manifold M. Okay, so, and now we, we, because we have this, you know, so S2 really, we, we think of it as being uh, CP1, okay? So it has a natural complex structure on it and J has a complex structure. So it makes sense uh, for this, uh, to us, for this U to be somehow uh, complex. And this makes sense even if you know the the map, uh, the, the 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 almost complex structure on M is not uh, integrable. So in particular, we say that we say that uh, U is uh, J holomorphic or pseudo holomorphic for J. Uh, okay, if uh, DU this is the, the the differential of this map this is from T of S two to T of M is complex linear at each point. So which means that uh, J uh, composed du, this is the same as du composed the little j of CP1. Okay, so this differential, which maps to, or it's, map, it's mapping to complex space, you want, you know, in general, in principle, just a linear map, but we want for it to be almost com uh, like complex linear. And, you know, in this, uh, from this perspective, it's unclear what kind of equation it is, uh, but, you know, if you, you, we can rewrite, of course, this, you, you can rewrite in terms of some kind of the bar equations, or equivalently, Uh, you can ask, this is uh, the natural version of the bar of J of U, uh, which is, you know, uh, 
equals zero. Okay, so this, you know, it's the u when you take the zero one part, essentially. Um, yeah, so you know, if you write in this equation, this is essentially the the usual Derbar equation. It's just things are not integrable, so that you have lower order terms also. Okay, so this is a nonlinear elliptic equation. So this is the nonlinear elliptic equation that we are interested in. Okay, so let me just uh, give a comment on why this is a good equation to study. Uh, and this is a good equation because uh, it's nice from a variation of viewpoints. So let me uh, just mention the following fact. Um, yeah, so you have, uh, let's say you have a map from S2 to M and, you know, we have fixed our J in arrivals. In particular, we have a Riemannian metric. Uh, so then, uh, you know, it makes sense to talk about the energy of you. So this is, uh, you know, by definition, you know, I'll define it to be the natural energy. Uh, this is the natural energy in the sense of harmonic maps. Okay, uh, so this is the natural energy you, you want to study when you, when you look at harmonic maps. And it turns out that in our setup, uh, so if you have J compatible, uh, this actually uh, turns out to be the same as the integral of, uh, uh, um, del bar J of U squared, or S2 plus the integral of u star of omega over s2. Okay, so this is a very cool identity. And the very important point is that this term, the second term, this, you know, this is, a, this is just the evaluation of the cohomology class of the symplectic form over the class of s2. Okay, so this really only depends on the homotopy class of S2. So this, uh, this is a topological quantity. So this depends on the um, uh, homotopy class. So if you have two, class, two maps U which are homotopic, then this, this final term will be the same. Uh, so you can see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, so J holomorphic curves, are the absolute minima. Of, uh, of the energy. In, in their homotopy class. Uh, so yeah, so you know, the, this is, uh, is very Im important. Um, so you know, uh, in general, when looking at variational problem, uh, we usually just look at critical points of functional and you expect the equation to be a second order equation, but it's very important in all these setups that I'll tell you about, we always look at absolute minima of equation. And it turns out that the, uh, the equation for this absolute minima in the topology class, the uh, topological class turns out to be a first order equation. Uh, I see there is a question by Ivan. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, so, so absolute so minimum, absolute you mean like global minimum 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 in the class? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a global minima in the in the class in the in this class of maps. Yeah. But uh, why it's absolute minimum? Why it's not just a critical point? What sorry? Why it's an absolute minima and not just a critical point? Oh, because you know uh, this uh, you know this term is fixed, and if you want to minimize, you kind of you know uh, this thing is positive, so you know the. To, to minimize it, if the bar is zero, you get the minimum possible. Yes, I understand this, but I understand why in the fixed homotopy class you should have a unique minima. Oh, I'm not saying that you have. You know, that, that's a that's a hard part to showing that this minima exists or like count them. Yeah, that's that's what we'll do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's not clear at all that this minima exists or are unique. In fact, in general, they don't exist any or they are not unique. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good point. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And um, maybe also from yes, okay. Sorry, there was a I wanted to the the there was a question in the chat about whether this definition right of uh, of energy also works for any 
other Riemann surface, I mean, other than S2, but. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, I'm just talking about S2 for simplicity, but, you know, here you can just fix <laughs> Riemann surface and uh, this whole story works, yeah. Thank uh, you. But the, the theory for spheres is already very rich and very complicated, so I'll, we'll stick with that for simplicity. That's a good point. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so now uh, we look at the space of solutions of these equations. Uh, so we have this equation. Now, of course, you know, uh, here, if you, um, so here is, is the most technical part of the theory. So this is, you know, um, so remember before, uh, the, the very nice thing is that the space of solution where it was a compact smooth manifold uh, of uh, a given dimension, right? So we would like that something like that to happen also for our situation. Um, and the statement that this, this space of solution is a compact, it's a, it's a smooth manifold, this is what usually uh, is referred in, in the, um, in the uh, as transversality for generic J. Uh, yeah, so this is the most technical part of the subject, so I will be very vague in the statements. I'll, you know, even to just state that an actual theorem it will take the whole lecture probably. So I'll just be very vague and hand wavy. So let me just say something like this. So in um, uh, favorable uh, circumstances. Uh, uh, parts of the space, the space of solutions. Uh, two. Uh, so you know we look at uh, CP one. Um, such that this J holomorphic equation holds. Um, and then, you know, um, CP1 has automorphisms. So um, we want to consider, you know, curves up to automorphisms. So we really think maybe a more like in the image of the curve automorphisms. Uh, so, you know, in, in the same way we think about geodesics or unparametrized geodesics, we want to think about unparametrized uh, curves in some sense of CP1. So U is the same as U compose phi for phi from CP1 to itself by holomorphism. Okay, so this is the analog of f of x equals p that we, 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 we were looking at before. Uh, so this is a smooth oriented manifold. Okay, so I, I've been big enough, you know, favorable circumstances, circumstances, certain parts of the thing. And, um, you know, the smooth manifold and the dimension you can compute it explicitly, of explicitly computable dimension. Uh, so this is some kind of Riemann rock type formula. Okay, so this involves in computing the index of certain linear, linearized operator. Um, and yeah, let me just say that, you know, uh, th these nice parts of the spaces will have different dimensions in, in, in general. So uh, you, 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 in general, depending on the homology class or um, yeah, you, you, uh, the, the, the nice parts of the moduli space will have different dimensions. Okay, so you, here the key point is that, you know, it's a smooth, a smooth oriented manifold with, uh, with some, some kind of dimension that we have control on. So this is usually the, the kind of transversality statement that follows in, you know, and the proof usually follows by some kind of, so here is again for generic J, so it will involve some kind of SARD argument together with some inverse function theorem. Okay, so this, uh, you know, uh, but yeah, this is definitely the, the most technical part of the, of the subject, I guess. And, uh, um, yeah, so our space of solution, this, this space of holomorphic curves, or this absolute minima of this functional, uh, have this nice um, proper, uh, uh, property that, that turn out to be smooth-oriented manifolds. Uh, and here, I guess, you know, secretly, ellipticity here is, is very important. So that, that, you know, unfortunately, we, we cannot go into the bolts and nuts of the theory to see where ellipticity is used, but 
you know, for example, the linearization is Fredholm, and that's uh, a very important part in this, uh, in this story. Um, yeah, so compactness. So remember, the, the key point before is that our space was a one-dimensional compact manifold. Uh, and so, so we, what remain, remains to be talked about is like this notion of compactness. Um, yeah, so compactness actually is false. Uh, uh, is false in general. Okay, so what can happen? So even if you look at, you know, let, let's say, even if you look at uh, even within uh, a given homotopy class of maps. Okay, so you know the, the intuitive picture to have in mind is that something like this happens. So, you know, you have a family of curves that somehow start to develop some kind of neck here, and at some point becomes like somehow more like two curve becomes a pair of curves that touch at a single point. So yeah, if you're familiar with the theory of uh, harmonic maps, this is you know uh, this is what is called bubbling. Um, this is, uh, let's say, a la sachs -Wullenbeck. Okay, and you know, this is something that happens really even in the simplest situation that you can imagine. So for example, um, yeah, so what was the simplest situation? So uh, let me, uh, so we can look at maps from CP1, so here uh, to CP2, and here we look at some map alpha, where alpha is some parameter in C, and we look at the map uh, that sends um, x, y, you know, in, in homogeneous coordinates to uh, uh, square, alpha y square, and X, Y. Okay, so if you look at what happens, you know, if for alpha going to zero, uh, what happens, you know, so let me draw, uh, I'll draw a two dimensional picture, like a real picture of what's going on. Um, yeah, so you start with your, you know, for some big alpha, you, you hit this thing here. And then as alpha gets smaller, you get closer and closer to this. OK, so it seems like you, you're going to be uh, converging to both the, the vertical and the horizontal line. But if you plug in alpha equals 0, you see that you know, alpha equals 0. You, you only actually, in the limit, this map only converges to the horizontal plane, actually. So somehow you lost the vertical plane in this, in, in this family of maps. Okay, and in particular, you know, uh, what happens is that you, you, you're not in the same homotopy class anymore, for example. Uh, yeah, so th this is, uh, you know, if you draw a picture, what, what happened it is exactly the picture upstairs with, the, with, the, with this extra bubble forming. So somehow we are only seeing in this limit, we are only seeing one of the two balls in, in this family, in the, in, in the convergence. Um, okay, but... Um, uh, luckily, uh, you know, this is something bad, of course, because our space is not compact anymore because you have this kind of uh, weird things that, you know, you converge to this kind of pair of things or, you know, things with this kind of bubbles. So you, you don't convert to spheres anymore. You convert to some more complicated objects. Uh, but um, the very cool thing is that uh, Gram of Compact, this is the, the, uh, the key analytical tool, is Gram of Compactness. And this is saying, you know, again, I'll be very vague on what this is saying, but this bubbling is the worst thing that can happen. Uh, so in particular, you know, um, if you have um, uh, an energy bound on your, uh, on, on, if you have a sequence of geomorphic curves with a, with a bound on the total energy, uh, then there is a subsequence that converges up to this uh, bubbling phenomenon, essentially. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, the, the the statement. Uh, okay, again, I'll, I'll be very vague. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind for later is that you, you see this is a, a co-dimension two phenomenon. So the the 
So here the, the spaces of alpha that you need to, you know, alpha is in C. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so notice this is a co-dimension two phenomenon. Okay, um, so in particular, you know, uh, the space of holomorphic maps is missing some kind of co-dimension two stuff in order to become compact. Okay, so, you know, you don't compactify by adding boundary, you compactify by adding some co-dimension two stuff. So you can think of, you know, it, it looks like CP1, a sphere minus a point, and maybe you add a point into it, and that's the kind of way you, you compactify things. So, yeah. So you you, send, you can think of your your missing a uh, your missing stuff in co-dimension two to become a compact space. Okay, but the, the compactification in general is not nice. It's not you know you can expect it to be a manifold or anything. Yeah, but it's um it, it's it's nice enough to do things. Anyways, so you know you know you, you, our original goal you know was to look at things uh, topological invariant was by counting solution of things. And you know the you know the mantra was oh we want spaces to be compact smooth manifolds with um, uh, with some nice computable dimension, and it turns out that you know this whole story that I mentioned about like this transversality and compactness is is definitely enough to define invariance of close impact manifolds at least in, in certain setups, and what you do is like counting you count certain geoholomorphic curves, so you know uh, and this allows you to Define invariance. Um, you know, you fix a uh, almost complex structure and you count holo certain type of holomorphic curves inside that, and that's usually you know it's often a zero, a finite number of uh, of solutions, and you count that. And that you know when you change th this is for a specific J, and then uh, the argument above uh, that I mentioned at the beginning, like by changing J, you you get a you show that this number doesn't change. Okay, so so for example, you can look at the examples that of invariants that arise this way are like uh, uh, quantum cohomology or stuff like that. Um, okay, of um, okay, so. Um, so yeah, so you can, uh, and these are very subtle invariants. So the, you know, in principle, they they, they see, uh, you know, um, the, the the very um, specific properties of your symplectic manifold, which are not uh, of the symplectic structure. Um, okay, um, yeah. So um, so this was the close story, and uh, I guess you know, in this in this uh, course, we're more interested in the in in, in this workshop, we're more interested in the in the Case of uh, contact manifold, so we we need to think about more about stuff with boundary. So in particular, now I want to sketch you a, a proof of um, the Elyashberg Gromov uh, theorem that uh, uh, Patrick mentioned yesterday. So this is the theorem that uh, using this holomorphic curves uh, machinery. So this is the theorem that if you have a, a three-dimensional um, um, uh, Contact manifold, which is over twisted, so it contains this kind of over twisted disk, uh, then uh, it is uh, not fillable. Okay, so maybe let me just point out that as a corollary, this also shows that S3 with the standard contact structure is tight. Okay, that's because, uh, you know, S3 is clearly fillable by the four balls, so this implies that it's not over twisted. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, let me just give you what. Uh, uh, so the basic idea will be very similar. We look at we look at some certain spaces of uh, this pseudo holomorphic curve, G holomorphic curves. Uh, but you know, I, I guess um, uh, it will have to be adapted to that specific problem we we are interested in. So. Um, so, so yeah, so this is the setup. So, you know, we will um, argue by contradiction. I'll assume that we have a, a three manifold which is fillable and has, which is both fillable and has an over twisted disk. So we have this over twisted disk that I draw very um, schematically here, which lies in the boundary and we have this compact filling too. Okay, so, uh, 
so yeah, so we look at uh, so we look at uh, the space of so now you know we have boundaries and we, before we we were working with a uh, close uh, surface, um, but now now we we'll, we we'll look at stuff with uh, boundary. Um, so so it, it's more natural to look at disks here, and we look at disks, uh, you know. Um, inside our manifold, which are J-holomorphic. Um, and uh, we need to pick a very specific J that it's adapted to our problem, so a specific J. OK? Uh, specific J. OK, so let me just tell you what kind of J's. You know, we, we want that, uh, you know, if we want special, uh, uh, almost complex structure which are adapted to a problem. Um, so first of all, we want our boundary to be convex in the sense of, you know, uh, almost complex geometry. Uh, and this is natural to us because, you know, we, we have this compatibility between the symplectic structure and the complex structure of the boundary. Uh, um, yeah, so you know, I, I guess uh, Patrick defined this, but you know, the the, the key example to have in mind is uh, I, I won't write down the, the, what this specifically means, but you know, this is the same as you know the fact that the boundary of D four is uh, S three side. Um, you know, if you pick all the standard possible structures, the boundary of S four is S three. And uh, the complex tangencies of the boundary is exactly the, the tight contact structure on S3. Um, OK. Um, yeah, so th this makes things uh, very nice. And in particular, you know, uh, um, this, if this is our manifold, there will be a defining function H here. OK. Uh, which is essentially given by this Liouville vector, uh, the, is defined by the Liouville vector field. So, you know, the, the, the boundary will be, this will be the set of H equals zero, for example. And the, the key point of having this and why this having this convexity makes things nice is that uh, uh, if, if U is J holomorphic for something like this, then U restricted, uh, sorry, this, this defining function. So in the case of the ball, this is just the radius. Uh, so H from D2 to R uh, is subharmonic. Okay, so once we have boundary, we have to be careful of what happens to the boundary. And the convexity uh, condition implies that if we look at uh, the, the, the disk will behave nicely at, at the boundary. So in particular, uh, there will be somehow uh, subharmonic. OK, so this is a direct consequence of subordinacy. Uh, so in particular, you know, the picture of what happens, you know, the, the disks, uh, you know, the boundary of the disk will be here and, you know, uh, they will be inside. So for example, no interior point of the disk had touched the boundary and that follows from the maximum principle. So the, the standard picture that we have of nice disks, properly embedded disks, follows from this convexity property. Um, OK. Uh, yeah, and then so another thing we will need is that uh, so the uh, we need totally real. Uh, we know we have this uh, w at the end of the day. We'll look at holomorphic disk whose uh, boundary lies in this over twisted disk. And uh, to make the Fredholm theory nice, we need the, uh, the 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 almost complex structure uh, uh, to to be. Uh, you know, we want this uh, over this to this to be totally real. Uh, this means that uh, so th this means that uh, IE J of tangent of BOT intercepted tangent of BOT. This is trivial. Okay, and this is again, uh, you know, uh, this is because um, you know so. Once you have, you know, the our del ball operator was elliptic uh, in the in the closed manifold, but now we're working on a, a manifold with boundary. So the the problem to make it the we need some kind of boundary condition to get nice moduli spaces. 
and totally real. This is the these are natural um, elliptic uh, boundary conditions. Okay, so this makes uh, our uh, bond, uh, our problem uh, nice from the point of view of um, uh, PDX. So in particular, this uh, this will this is the proper this guarantees Fredel and prop the Fredel property, for example, of the linearization. So um, that's um, yeah. So you know there, there are other uh, kind of boundary problems that you can uh, boundary condition that you can try to put on, on in general when you have boundary. Uh, uh, but this is the one that which is naturally um, 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 naturally arises. And you know, you might ask why I'm asking for zero and uh, an interior, and that's because on the in, in the over twisted disk, the the center and the boundary are tangent to the contact structure, so they are actually J invariants. So you cannot ask it uh, for there to be J uh, totally real, but you can ask it. For it to be totally real everywhere else, okay, and that's the the, the thing. Um, yeah, and then uh, you know we 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 we'll ask for this uh, almost complex structure. You know, we're asking a lot of things uh, for this contact structure, but you know, you can still find a, a nice space of these contact structures. Uh, sorry, these almost complex structures, and we want this to look standard near the over the zero of the over twisted disk. Uh, so what this means is that you know so we have our over twisted disk. Um, okay, so this is tangent to the uh, to your. Uh, so we want the neighborhood of this origin to look like uh, z goes to uh, z square root of one minus z square. Uh, and this is a sphere inside S3 with a standard contact structure uh, inside C2. Okay, and I'll go back to this uh, to this local model later. But you know, um, uh, yeah. So this this gives us a, a nice local model for the. Uh, you know, we want the almost complex structures to look like the standard model around this this point here, this center here. And we'll, I'll go back later to why uh, this is needed. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, okay. So this is the the uh, the geometric setup. And now let me tell you what equations uh, we're going to look at. Um, yeah, so we look at uh, the holomorphic curves. Uh, sorry, the the maps on the disk to this manifold, uh, to this filling, and we want um, sorry, did I call it M? So, yeah, uh, which are J holomorphic for this specific choice of J that I made, and I want the uh, over twisted the, the the boundary of this uh, um, this uh, this curve, this uh, this disk to lie in the over twisted disk. And again, I consider this space up to reparameterizations. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, and yeah, so th there is a natural family in here um, that we can write out, and that's because we have this standard model. So there's a there is a standard family. Okay, so uh, our over twisted. Let me write again. So, so if you if you look our over twisted disk uh, near zero, like the the imaginary component, the the second component is real. So I'll I'll just draw the real component. So this is um, real of C two, and our disk looks something like this. So the direction is uh, the C. Okay, and now I'll look at, at the family for S. So if you pick uh, S uh, in zero epsilon, I'll look at the disk DS, which is the sphere that this is on Z to SZ uh, square root of one minus S square. 
Okay, so the, the disk, this is D0. And the, you know, these are just these horizontal disks. You know, the epsilon. Okay, so we have this nice family of, you know, I, I just wrote them down. Uh, the, there's this nice family of disks uh, with boundary on our over-twisted disk. Yeah, so sorry, there's two disks here. There's over-twisted disk and the disk we are looking at mapping. So the, the, I'm sorry if that causes some confusion. And yeah, so this is a nice, this is what is called the Bishop family. Uh, okay, and you know, uh, one can compute uh, that this lives uh, lives in a, a one-dimensional modular spaces. Okay, and here, you know, the, as, as again I was mentioning before, uh, there is uh, the modular spaces have, are, you know, we can hope for them to be a smooth manifold. And the very nice thing is that what happens uh, is that in this case, we can actually compute uh, the, the dimension. It turns out to be one dimension on this modular space. Um, yeah, so actually, you know, there's this constant map and that turns out to be, you know, so we are in the, in the, the there's some kind of more complicated things here happening, but this Bishop family is like the end of a one dimensional component of the modular space. Okay, so this will be our Bishop family. And then the question is like, you know, the modular space has to be a compact one manifold. You know, it has to leave, the component is a compact one manifold. Uh, so the, the point is that, you know, there has to be another boundary point here. Okay, so we, if we look at the space of holomorphic curves in, in, in this family, you know, we can go on one end, we, we, we go to this constant map. And on the other hand, well, we have to go to somewhere else, right? Because we know that generically the modular space will be a compact one manifold. So this is it's a we uh, so so this is a compact one manifold. So the other boundary point. Uh, so the question is like, what is this? Okay, and the point is that one now shows using the geometry that the, there's no curve that uh, you know uh, um, geometry tells us. that uh, this, cannot, this cannot exist. Okay, so uh, it, like, what do I mean by this? So before, for example, uh, we show, um, we mentioned that in the closed case, uh, what, what happens in boundary points, what you get are like bubble curves. And what you can show in this case is that this bubble curve cannot appear. And you know, here it's because bubble curve are a co-dimension two thing and we are uh, one dimensional, uh, Manifold, so there, there's no bubbling happening here, and you know, but um, so AG bubbling happens in condemnation two. Uh, but in this case, you have to be careful because you know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an open manifold. Um, um, um. It's a, it's a, sorry, we're working with a manifold with boundary uh, to begin with. So, you know, the, um, so the gram of compactness uh, statement is a little more complicated. So you, you, there are more complicated things that you need to rule out, uh, but and bubbling is only one of them. So uh, you, you might have a bubble on the boundary or like more, more complicated things. Uh, that can, uh, so can I interrupt you for a second? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is a question in the chat about, so how exactly do we see uh, that this bishop family lives at one end of the of the one dimensional moduli space. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good point. So uh, uh, really, the the right moduli space to look at is the moduli space of curves like this, um, uh, like no, and and which are non constant. And then you know the I guess you you will recognize that uh, you know one of the endpoints that happens is like the constant map would be one of the boundary points in, in this modular space. Uh, yeah, so there it's a it's a non-trivial statement is that you know the this you know you, you cannot go yeah it, the, the the constant map is a boundary point is a is a non-trivial statement I guess yeah okay um Jacobus I let that okay okay thank you <laughs> yeah 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 so maybe it's intuitive but non-trivial I guess that, let's put it this way uh 
Okay, so you know, uh, and this is the way you prove it. So you know, uh, you have this one-dimensional modular space, and you know, uh, analysis tells us that you, ha you there exists the other the other boundary points exist, uh, but then you you look at the, your Excel setup and you see that this other boundary point just cannot exist. Uh, yeah, and this is so the, the proof is by contradiction. So I was assuming that the manifold was both. Uh, both had an over twisted disk and was fillable, so this tells you that both, you cannot have the two things at the same time. So this is the contradiction. Uh, yeah, so an analogous proof, I guess. Uh, yeah, so uh, to prepare this talk, I looked at Klaus' paper actually, so hopefully I didn't say stuff which is too wrong uh, or <laughs> too silly. Um, uh, but yeah, so he uh, he worked out the uh, a, a much uh, more general version that holds in higher dimension of, of this, this statement. Yeah, but again, the, this co-dimension two thing is, is really one of the keys. Um, yeah, so in the last five minutes, uh, I'll, let me just say a couple of words of, you know, um, uh, about cyber witten theory. Uh, so what, what, what cyber witten theory does for you and can, you, can, you can use it for. So let me tell you uh, cyber witten theory. Okay, so here instead of studying uh, the pseudo hallmark equation, we look at uh, three manifolds and four manifolds and study some kind of equations coming from uh, gauge theory. And let me just give you uh, the, the formal picture. Um, yeah, so you know, if you have a three manifold, what cyber within theory does. Uh, is that it associates some kind of uh, abelian group. So this is called, uh, this is an abelian group. So this is the, this is due to Kronheimer and Rothka. So this is some kind of their homology group. Okay, and this is a topological invariant, uh, and this is uh, obtained by counting solution to the cyber witten equation in some sense. So this, uh, so by counting, okay, uh, and yeah, and if you have a contact structure. Um, you get an element in this group. This is called a contact invariant. Uh, okay, and this is an invariant. Uh, and here, essentially, you can't cyber with a solution with some kind of boundary condition in the contact structure in some sense. Okay, so the contact structure will give you some kind of modify equation to look solutions of. And you know the, the contact invariant this is a uh, uh, this is uh, this is invariant uh, up to isotopy. Okay so if you have two contact structures which are uh, isotopic as contact structure then they have the same contact invariant. So in particular you can use the contact invariants to distinguish uh, contact structures. Um, yeah, and uh, let me just tell you, so the, 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 this gives you a way, and it, it's a fairly computable way, so you know, in, in many situations you can use, uh, if you have certain descriptions of your contact structure, you can compute these contact invariants and show that your contact structures are not uh, contactomorphic or isotopic as contact structures. And to, uh, to, to wrap up, to, to, to wrap up, I guess we had these two questions at the beginning, like, uh, you know, uh, so this, 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 uh, this invariance also give you a perspective on this Jasper Gromov theorem. And in particular, uh, you know, this is, uh, the, this, this is the following theorem. This was, you know, this was proved by Cheveria. So if psi is over twisted, uh, then this contact invariant 
is zero. So there's nothing in, you know, this content invariant doesn't tell you anything interesting about over two step content structure, but yeah, that's fine because we know that there isn't much to say there. And then if uh, Xi is fillable, then uh, this contact invariant is non zero actually. Okay, so you know, uh, from this, you, you conclude the drama of the theorem again. So, the, so uh, but this is somehow a more um, advanced perspective because then th this idea allows you to distinguish contact structures actually. And um, so you get, you get some kind of more refined invariance rather than just being able to say over twisted or not. Um, um, okay, I think uh, uh, I'll stop here. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Francesco. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, are there questions?